Hello again, and thanks for choosing to watch my working knowledge version of how distribution capacitor banks compensate for inductive loads. My name is Tom Sullivan, and in this video, we'll discuss resistive and inductive loads in different parallel circuit combinations to see how capacitors can be used to compensate for the extra current load of inductive devices such as motors and transformers. Capacitors are used in electric utility distribution systems to compensate for the extra current load of inductive devices because those effects are twofold, causing greater line losses and greater voltage drop, both of which decrease the overall efficiency of an electric utilities distribution system. My mathless approach to this topic will use current and voltage sine wave diagrams rather than mathematical formulas in an effort to make this topic more widely appealing to a broader audience. So as a bit of background, let's start with a diagram of a 120 volt, 60 hertz sine wave. For our 60 hertz systems in the United States, it takes 1 60th of a second for the voltage to complete one cycle as shown here. Even though the x-axis depicts time, you'll often see the values shown in degrees, where 360 degrees are equal to 1 60th of a second. On my graphs, the x-axis is in radians, which is another measurement like degrees. The peak value of this sine wave is approximately 1.4 times its nominal value of 120 volts. Interestingly, this nominal value actually has three different names. The RMS value, which stands for root mean square, the direct current equivalent, or DCE value, and its third name is effective value. I think it's worth mentioning too here that the y-axis will usually be marked with just one set of numbers, but those numbers can be applied to multiple units. For example, when voltage and current are both displayed on one graph, this one set of numbers will apply to both quantities. We'll start with a simple circuit containing a source and a resistor. Here I'm using a three volt source feeding a one and a half ohm resistor, which draws two amps. We can see that the voltage magnitude is constantly changing, and as a result, the current's magnitude also changes in direct proportion. The result is that the current and voltage are in phase, meaning that the points where they're both zero or at their peak occur at the same time. Our next circuit is a source and an inductor whose value is one and a half ohms. So it also draws two amps from the source. But as we can see in this diagram of the voltage and current, in this circuit, the current lags the applied voltage by a quarter of a cycle or a 240th of a second or 90 degrees. 
So unlike the resistors in phase current, the inductor's current is out of phase as a result of its process of alternately storing energy in and releasing energy from its magnetic field. In our third circuit now, we'll look at our three volt source with a one and a half ohm capacitor drawing two amps. And we'll see in this case, the current actually leads the voltage by a quarter of a cycle. This happens because the capacitor is alternately storing energy in and releasing energy from its electric field. And this brings up an important point to highlight here. And that is that functionally, the capacitor and the inductor actually do the exact same thing. They spend half their time acting as a load, removing energy from the circuit and storing it in their field, a magnetic field for the inductor and, a, and an electric field for the capacitor. And the other half of the time, they act as a source, returning that energy back to the circuit from those fields. The big difference between them is just their timing. With the capacitor drawing a leading current and the inductor drawing a lagging current. Soon, however, we'll see how this can be used to our advantage. Now let's look at a source with both a resistor and an inductor in parallel. This will simulate a motor load on the feeder by causing the source current to lag the applied voltage. Here are the waveforms. The current in the resistive leg in black is in phase with the applied voltage which isn't shown in this diagram. And the current in the inductive leg in red lags the resistive current and the voltage by a quarter of a cycle. The source current, the blue curve, is the sum of these two currents and is perhaps surprisingly not their algebraic sum of two plus two equals four. And it's not in phase with either of the two currents, but rather halfway between the two, lagging the voltage by an eighth of a cycle, or about two milliseconds. Now, even if you're not familiar with sine wave addition like this, I think it's pretty easy for us to check that the source current curve is in fact the sum of the other two by simply checking a few points on the graph. When the resistive current is zero, you can see that the source current and the inductive current are equal. When the source current is zero, you might think the current in the circuit should be zero, but it's not because the inductive element is acting as a source at that point and outputting current that feeds the resistor. 
So their values are equal but opposite. When the inductive current is zero, we can see that the source current is equal to the resistive current. So the source is feeding the resistor. And when the resistive current and the inductive currents are equal here, you can see that the total current from the source is at its maximum. I'll leave it to you to check the rest of the points if you like. The important point to see here is that the total current is more than the real current. And that means that there are unnecessary losses in the circuit conductors and a larger voltage drop at the load, both of which adversely affect the circuit's ability to serve its customers. Let's look at the diagram of both the circuit components and the distribution feeder together to get a better feel for what this means in real life. As you can see, the current of 2.8 amps flows from the substation all the way down the line to the customer and then feeds the resistor and inductor in parallel. To reiterate, there are two problems with this situation. There are unnecessary losses in the circuit conductors and a larger voltage drop at the customer end. To compensate for this extra current drawn by the inductor, let's add a capacitor in parallel and analyze the results. Here's the circuit diagram and the currents in each leg. The resistor's current in blue, in phase with the voltage, which isn't shown here. The inductor's current in black, lagging the voltage by a quarter cycle and the capacitor's current in red, leading the voltage by a quarter cycle. And what you can see here is that the quarter cycle lag for the inductor and the quarter cycle lead for the capacitor results in their two currents being out of phase by 180 degrees. Looking at the waveforms, we can see that at every point in time, their values are identical, but in their directions are opposite. So from the source's perspective, this means that those currents cancel each other with the capacitor feeding the inductor or the inductor feeding the capacitor. And that means the source only needs to supply current to the, in, to the resistor. Again, let's look at the circuit and feeder diagrams together to get a feeling for what's really happening here. Substation is supplying two amps all the way down the feeder 
to the active portion of the customer's motor load. And the capacitor on the pole just outside the customer's facility and the inductive portion of the customer's motor load are exchanging their two amps of reactive power back and forth. From the customer's perspective, they can see no difference between this situation and the one in which the substation was supplying all the power. But from the utilities perspective, there's a considerable savings because the feeder's two amps generates a lot less conductor heating losses than the original 2.8 amps. And the voltage drop at the customer's end of the feeder is much smaller too. In summary then, because the capacitor compensates for the customer's inductive load, the source now supplies only the feeder's minimum current requirement, the resistor's real energy needs, which makes the source voltage and current in phase and the power factor one. This reduction in current also minimizes the circuit's conductor losses and voltage drop at the customer end, which improves the feeder's efficiency and voltage regulation. The extra good news is that while we've used a resistor and inductor in parallel for this example, the same process works for a resistor and inductor in series too. In either case, adding a parallel capacitor whose value is equal to the inductive load drops the source's current output to just the in-phase value needed for the resistive load. Interestingly enough, compensation is an exact science in the sense that too little is actually the same as too much. Remember that the inductive and capacitive currents are 180 degrees out of phase and therefore cancel each other. So in our above example, if the capacitor drew one and a half amps instead of two amps, there would have been a half an amp of inductive current that wouldn't have been canceled. That would have meant that a half an amp gets added to the resistive current, causing more lossage, losses and voltage drop. But if instead there were two and a half amps of capacitive currents, then two amps of that would have been canceled and the extra half amp of capacitive current would be added to the resistive current. That would result in the same magnitude of current flow on the distribution feeder and the same losses and voltage drop caused by the excess inductive current. So in general, whether it's inductive or capacitive, excess reactive current causes line losses and voltage drop that's undesirable. In the real world, it's usually the inductive load that we're chasing in an attempt to compensate with capacitors and keep those undesirable effects to a minimum. And those efforts can usually keep the power factor somewhere between 90 and 100%. If you want more information than this video provided, or if you'd like to ask questions about the material in this video, or participate in a group discussion about the information presented here, please visit theelectricclassroom.com.